Welcome everyone to Textiles and Tea. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising Marketing Manager for HGA and I get to be your host today. Um, we want to welcome Mon uh, the Montana Association of Weavers and Spinners. They are hosting uh, Textiles and Tea, are sponsoring Textiles and Tea today. We thank them. Um, they are getting ready for a conference next spring. You might want to go onto their website and check that out. Um, and that will be in 2023. Um, we will take your questions today, as always, if you will put them in the uh, questions, the Q&A, and not in the chat. Um, it's going to be even harder for me today. If you notice, I'm somewhere different. I'm at the Chattahoochee Handweavers Guild. Um, they have gracious, graciously, generously loaned us looms for Convergence. They're in Atlanta. Um, so we've been loading up looms today and equipment, spinning wheels, ink looms, you name it. So this is what's involved behind the scene to make sure Convergence is successful. And if it wasn't for the generosity of guilds like Chattahoochee, we wouldn't be able to do this. So if you see somebody from Chattahoochee this weekend while you're at Convergence, tell them thank you. Um, and we do appreciate they were out there in this morning in the heat helping me load everything onto the truck that's heading up there uh, tomorrow. So thank you again to Chattahoochee. Uh, today, we have Bonnie Tarsus. I'm so excited to have her on. Um, heard about her forever, so it's exciting to actually talk to her. Bonnie is a textile designer specializing in one-of-a-kind and custom hand-woven textiles since 1960. From the time she began her weaving journey, she was drawn to the color symbolism in all ethnic textiles. She said, I continue to be amazed by the fact that weavers of old attach special meanings to the placement of every thread. In search of a set of personal symbols, Bonnie developed several techniques that have become her trademarks, color horoscope weaving, which we will talk about, woven words, and the turn weft ecot. So we are excited to have Bonnie here today. Hi, Bonnie. Where am I? Um, there you oh, go. Here I am. Yes. <laughs> I got so oh, interested in here. I got so interested in listening to your introduction. I forgot. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, I got to do something. Yeah. <laughs> well, you did well. You did well. Well, let's start off with the most important question. What is your favorite tea? Ah, well, um, tea I make myself, and <gasps> this is a really cool cup. Um, it is, it, and it has weavers and spiders on it, made for me, my special. And um, I make a chai, and um, in the afternoon, I just use rooibos. And if it's in the morning, I'll add um, Assam tea with that, and special spices, and ginger, and alternate milks, depending upon my mood of the day. So, <laughs> Well, thank you, a fellow chai drinker. I love chai. Um, I wanted to start off and talk some about, when I think of you, I think of you are color. You're so connected to color because it's, and your relationship is much more like, oh, I like that color. I don't like that color or that color looks good with something else. You put special meaning into all the colors. You have a relationship with a capital R. Um, and as we look at some of your samples of your colorful work, can you talk some about this special relationship between you and color? Well, you know, it's sort of like weather, you know, I like weather, some weather I like better than other weather. Um, and the thing about where I went to school and everything, we would do a lot of stuff with, with pigment. And the thing that's different about weaving, it's more like pointillism so that all the colors, if you mix red and blue together, you don't get um, purple you get red and blue in little <laughs> dots. And if you go at a certain distance or the light is in a certain way, it'll show up as a different color. And so early on, I sort of got into doing color gamps mm -hmm. and I was so fascinated by how a, one color would cross over another color. And, you know, that I would, they would just be all over the place because if I did a color gamp and then I wove it through in red, 
I said, well, well, I wonder how green would look. You know, I wonder how purple would look. And so I would have, and then I wondered, well, if I wove this in mohair, how would those colors look? And if I wove that in, in silk, how would those colors look? And if I wove it in cotton, how would those colors look? And somehow it's more like, you know, I, I mostly 98 or 99.8% of what I weave is plain weave. And it's not that I can't weave other things. It's that basically I like to have, it's just holding the cloth, the warp together. So basically all my designing is done in the warp. And uh, so if you make the weft too um, prominent, it kind of takes away from the warp, you know? So hmm. that's, I could probably talk about this for old oh, days, but um, you know, let's, it'll, I'll swing back to it. Uh, did I answer that uh, sufficiently? You know? I think you did brilliantly, brilliantly. Well, the other thing that you're known for are cranes, that you make these beautiful paper cranes. And in this next image, we have uh, a picture of- uh, That's not cranes. That's not cranes. I'm sorry, I've, I've skipped a question here. Sorry, Mandy. Um, well, this, this is talking more about the meaning of color. Um, yeah. When we talk about meaning. On the right, that is, if I've got this right, that is Mary Miggs Atwater's horoscope, right? Yes. 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 And it is, um, you figured that out, you wove that yourself. And then the one on the left is a mandala from, of your daughter, right? Yes. So again, the, you, you take the threads and you give them meaning, um, even when you do the woven word, right? Like every, every thread has so a, I would, a letter. You know, the, I was very inspired by Guatemalan textiles and by Scottish tartans. Now I, oh. haven't, I haven't read anywhere, but I, I don't know that I, and I really believe this is true. Mm -hmm that the Scottish tartans, that each color and thread had a meaning about how much property the person owned, how many children, how many, how many animals, and that somehow it was a language and that there was a lot of information conveyed in the threads. And the same thing with Guatemalan textiles, that you could tell what village they came from. And, and um, many, somebody said the screen shared is blank, um, by the way. Um, I don't know whether you see that. I don't. We see whether, you, we, we see okay. your work. Okay, all right. Um, so somehow I wanted to take the idea of threads as a language and bring that into the modern era and that make a textile that was personal to, um, to each individual. Mm -hmm. So really what these are, are personal color gams. You know, <laughs> like if you were a rainbow, that would be the rainbow you would be. I used 12 colors. And they combine to make over 5 billion color possibilities. The human eye can only pick up about 8 million variations. So essentially, these are the, like the dog whistle of color. You know, I've had, I've had colorblind people. They are fascinated by that because they can see the nuance, but they can't put a name to it. You know, they wouldn't say that's blue and next to red, but I would say, can you see the difference between this stripe and that stripe? And they always could, even though it, it was just slight. So um, also I can tell you, um, I, you know, I went to Rhode Island School of Design 
and I studied textile design. And one of the main things that they taught is how to um, set up parameters and how to, you know, so I always say, you know, that you want to take small steps, you know, and you want to have tight parameters in everything that you make, you know, and so I, so I made and assignments were always called problems. So I, the problem when I left, I said, okay, I want to make something that I know how long it's going to take me to make, how much yarn I'm going to have to use, how much I charge for it, and that it would always be different every time I would make it so I wouldn't be bored, and that it couldn't be produced commercially. So those were the, those were the things I was thinking about for um, for about ten years, um, and then my glib answer is I was walking down weaving one day, and I was walking down astrology one day, and I bumped into myself. But there, there's a lot more that goes into it, but that fulfilled so much of what I was trying to do. You know, and there is this one little thing is that um, it's really hard to sell something to someone when you can't tell them what it's going to look like. Mm. And um, so I didn't take that into consideration, but it, it has come back to, to bite me more than once, you know. Uh, <laughs> Well, how did, now were you into horoscopes? You read horoscopes, had your horoscope done, everything before you started making this weaving pattern? Well, not, like I said, I was walking down weaving, you know, so somewhere in, um, well, I had, I suffered a, a very intense personal tragedy in the early 70s. And somehow um, my daughter was murdered. And when something that makes absolutely no sense, I started to try to find something that would make something that was so unthinkable. How do you, how do you, how do you make sense out of that? Mm -hmm. And so, and someone, casually said, well, when is your birthday? And I told them and they handed me my horoscope. And I said, well, what does this mean? And they handed me a book. And so I spent the next rest of my life trying to figure out what my horoscope meant. But I have to say that I know that at that time, the word astrology and the word heroin and the word leprosy were all like the same word, you know. Um, now it's 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 changed a lot, um, but at any case, to think of it more as an art rather than something as a science, and it is a way to look at the world. And the fact that it has persisted for time immemorial is very interesting to me. And the truth of it is, it is the only thing that has actually been able, I've been able to make sense out of, out of what happened. And through weaving and through this kind of weaving, I've been able to do some intense healing. And um, so, um, so yeah, I, it, it wasn't until I was in my thirties that somehow I even, you know, it's the same thing about weaving, you know, 
how did I get into weaving? It was even weirder than that. You know, well, tell us, how did you get into weaving? Well, I was, I went to Rhode Island School of Design. I was going to go into apparel design. I had never heard of textile design. It was sort of like milk comes in can bottles, you know, and that, you know, so cloth is just, it's just there, you know. Uh, so I was meeting someone for lunch. I made a wrong turn. I walked into a room full of looms and I, I, my jaw dropped. I don't know what, I just looked at, I, and these were looms that were um, sample looms from the industrial revolution. Hmm. You know, they, I've been trying to find a picture of one of these looms and they were designed to discourage anybody from ever weaving. I mean, they were, I mean, I, it would take me a whole afternoon to describe how, what it took to set these things up. And um, I'm sure that they're in some museum somewhere, you know. <laughs> um, um, but, um, but I went and changed my major. So in, at Rhode Island School of Design, you go through a freshman foundation program. Mm -hmm. And even though you have to say what your major is going to be, you don't start it until your sophomore year. So here I am 19 years old, I, and I've never woven, but I decided I'm gonna go into textile design. And I, at 19, I said, I know what I wanna do. I want, I'm, I wanna be a weaver. Wow. And so I think that I realized that there's something that's so, uh, I, I feel so blessed that before I was old enough to drink, I knew what I wanted to do. And I know people spend their lives, you know, trying to find mm -hmm. that thing. So, although in my horoscope, it does say, something about, it doesn't say weaving per se, but, but Pallas Athena is among other things, the goddess of wisdom is also the goddess of weaving. Hmm. So she um, and Arachne had a, um, had a weaving contest, uh -huh. you know, and she wound up changing Arachne into a spider because Arachne um, was was mocking the gods, you know? And so anyway, so that's a whole other story, but there is a, um, a, a planetary body that, um, that stands for Pallas Athena. And that is in the house of creativity, exactly sitting on Venus, the planet of, love art and beauty so I you know people who who have not known what I do would say you it's not like you want to do it it's like you have to do it so I, we think, can there, I think there's a lot of us who are really glad you made a wrong tour and you you and you and weaving found each other we're all very happy about that Yes, but um, I do want to, so how I got into origami, and that's pretty late, you know, that was in 2015. Oh, okay. You know, and I was, and um, I want, I was living in a house that um, had this, this front steps and it's an old craftsman house and uh, the pigeons were, uh, were pooping all over my steps. And I, I wanted to find an aesthetic deterrent to keep the pigeons from pooping on my steps. And I said, oh, I think I'll learn how to fold cranes because they'll twirl around. And, and so that's what got me into it. And then a friend of mine was very ill. And, and I, was, I said, oh, I just don't know what to do or say. And somebody said, you know, there's this uh, tradition that if you fold a thousand cranes and string them on a string and give them as a gift, you get to have a wish. 
And I said, oh, here I am folding cranes. So I folded a thousand cranes. And when she came home from the hospital, they were all hanging on her porch. And let me tell you, there I could not have done anything more. I'm, and and then um, some friends said to me, oh, the uh, Jeanette Rankin Peace Center in Missoula is folding cranes to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. And I said, oh, I'm already folding cranes. You know, so I wound up teaching that people how to fold cranes. Um, they wanted to do recycled paper. So I, uh, I cut up um, 5,000 sheets of, from National Geographic and I probably folded about 3,000 cranes and taught a lot of people. And then on, you can see on that, um, the picture of us holding a bunch of cranes. That, um, those were cranes that we made, um, well, on the last day of folding those cranes, this woman came in who um, had just moved from, from New Hampshire. And I said, well, this is our last day. And she said, well, do we have to stop? And I said, well, I guess not. So we started meeting and, um, and we folded um, cranes for, um, there was some anti-Semitic things going on at a synagogue and we folded a thousand cranes for them. We folded a thousand cranes, those went to Standing Rock. And, um, and so we, we did a lot of the senior center was struggling to stay open and we folded a thousand cranes for the senior center. And, and, um, and then I was just off and running, you know? <laughs> so I'm currently working on um, my 29,000 cranes. So, um, you know, you can do it anywhere you can oh it got me through the pandemic let me tell you um if you go onto youtube there are literally thousands and thousands of disembodied hands folding things <laughs> i you know i just it's it's more entertaining than politics let me tell you and um um and so it really, oh, and people all over the world, people all over the world are doing this. And, um, and then, and a lot of like, um, weaving is sort of, is sort of female dominated. Mm -hmm. And in, in origami, it's interesting. There's a lot of chill, young people, adolescents, they're old people. There's a lot of men. Um, it's it's really a very interesting community, and you can carry you can put it in your pocket. You can carry it anywhere. You can leave it as tips. You know, you know when you're waiting and wait in lines. You can you know anyway. It's it, and so essentially, it has become what I would consider my spiritual practice. You know, and. Um, that one thing that I mentioned to you, you know, that in the midst of the pandemic, 47 years after the death of my daughter, um, a police detective shows up at my door saying they have located through DNA evidence, my daughter's killer, who is de was deceased, but they have notified the family. So I just was so, uh, overwhelmed at the idea that that you would find out, you know. Oh, by the way, your grandfather was a murderer, you know. Or, so I um, I I wrote to them and said that I would fold them a thousand cranes with the wish that they find healing and peace. And so as soon as I did that. It was, I had the closest thing to a, a transcendent experience. And I mean, I feel like I have completed something. It was just, 
amazing. So, you know, if you're struggling with anything, you know, fold a thousand cranes, you know. And um, I do have a tutorial on um, Vimeo. If you oh, okay. if you put my name or Gami Cranes, um, and um, I, I hung my phone off of the chandelier above my table and folded, and I mean it, it's pretty rough, but a, a, but if people say they can do it from my my instructions. Anyway, I love how it, I love how it can be very personal individual kind of thing or you can do it with a group that's wonderful that you can do it both ways yes and also after i had done about 10 or 12 um suddenly they they changed from uh go they became like a, a textile so these things are more it's it's more like cloth than it is like like a bunch of cranes flying around. So I basically, if. Um, oh, wow. So instead of just to show you that, you know, so when people say, well, how is this a crane? But if I, if you fold down the wings oh. and then you bring out the, the head And then you, oh, so then it's a crane. Well, um, I wondered on that last picture, because I think that's what that was, right? They were like stacked. Yeah, but oh, I, I did this quite by accident when really? I was trying to, this is, this is, this step, I call this the invasion of the body snatchers, because it kind of looks like a seed pod, but it's really <laughs> easy to um, transport them that way, rather than once the wings are out, they become, mm -hmm. you know, a little more, um, but you know, the it, from 2015, those cranes are still on that porch. And I know they've gotten wind and rain and it's Montana and they're still there, you know, so. Oh, and I should mention, um, in case you don't want to do a thousand cranes, you can, do a string and then you can i call it crane bombing that you sneak around to people that you like and it's sort of trick or treat in reverse and you sort of hang them off of their porch or on a fence and run away you know so and that's my other thing i love that bonnie that's great i can see you doing that that's awesome <laughs> it's great <laughs> well i want to talk some more about you your weaving um you mostly your work is about color because you said earlier that you just soon do uh, plain weave as you would any other structure so would would you consider yourself you know just more of a dyer not a dyer but more of a color theorist than you are say a, a tr structure person like i said if i could figure out a way to get the warp to stay together without weaving you know, I mean, it just, it's, it's basically for, you know, for the war, you know, and in terms of dying, um, Miss Michelle Whiplinger used to die for me. Um, oh, really? Yeah. And um, in fact, this piece, um, that piece, she died that yarn. Huh. Um, and um, and then uh, Cheryl Colander died for me. Um, so basically, I used to call what I did Easy Ecot. And I would say that the secret of Easy Ecot is to get someone else to dye the yarn for you. Now, when I first started doing this, you rarely ever um, could, could see um, variegated yarn it was very rare now it's rare to find yarn that isn't variegated and and so um so i've done this thing where and i wrote an article for one of the magazines and they and they didn't they wouldn't put easy ecot they called they changed it and didn't tell me and called it faux ecot 
And oh, really? I, and I did not like that because, but I figured out, I call it now um, almost ECOT. If you're using commercial uh, space dyed yarn uh -huh. um, and basically even, and then the, this, this I call um, turned weft ECOT. So I dye it in, it's dyed in a skein as if you were gonna do weft ecot, but then I, one by one, line the threads up and make those designs as, so you don't, you can bypass all the planning, you know? And so I don't know what these are gonna look like. I just start doing it and then I see what comes out, you know? So. Also, I found out much later that a lot of the, the weaving that I do is sort of like Sayori philosophy. Mm. And I don't, and I, I, I just sold my Sayori loom, but I got one for a while. And it was really fun for teaching because, you know, in two minutes, anybody can be weaving if they can count to two. You know, that is. So the, for, for those who aren't familiar with Sayori, can you just give a brief what their theory is or over, over yeah over. I mean it is a philosophy and it also there's a, a loom you know and um, yeah. that um, but it's basically anybody can weave there are no rules there are no mistakes um, so again I could say anybody at Sayori is for everybody except weavers you know, weavers are <laughs> horrified. What do you mean there's no rules? What do you, you know, so I just <laughs> taught a work. I was just teaching um, at the, um, at the Moz conference. And um, I, I was, I teach one class that I was calling spontaneous weaving from the heart. So basically you just kind of just see what happens. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you just start at one place and then you kind of go, oh, that looks good. I wonder, you know, and this is what you're saying. I wonder what would happen if I, you know, and so Sayori is more of a weft and texture driven. So it's totally mm -hmm. the opposite of this that I do, you know, but there, but there's this, a kind of uh, sameness of sort of not planning ahead mm -hmm. and try, you know, what you plan. You plan is you know how wide you want it to be and you know, and then that's all you really need to know. You know, it's, it's sort of like you're working from a blank canvas, you know. So um, it's so opposite of all of this that it's really like, like I love to weave in black and white, you know, because it's so opposite of everything that I do in color, you know, but. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. So um, I don't know, did, I don't even remember the question. You're did I? doing great. You're doing great. Well, let me ask you something. I saw a statement that you made in an article or an interview. I forgot which. And I loved it. I'm always saying on this show that I want to make plaques of these sayings and put them up around me. And this is one of them. I love this one. It said, the highest reward for your effort is not what you get from it but what you become by it. Do you remember saying that? Do you remember referring yes. to that? And I remembered that I loved that. And um, I did look it up in the name of the guy who said it is John Ruskin is okay. his name. And, and it's slight, there's one slight difference, the highest reward for a person's toil. Ah, okay. Uh, but it, you know, it's, it's close enough, you know? And, um, but I think that it made me feel good because it was always such a struggle between money and weaving. And, you know, and 
I, I always what was in such conflict, knowing that if I didn't have to, I wouldn't sell my weaving. Hmm. I would barter it. I would gift it, you know, but, and that's the other thing about us, about the cranes is people say, well, how much are they? I said, I don't sell them. So by giving away this something that takes you a hundred hours, you know, is there something that is very freeing about that. And it, it sort of makes it okay. You know, it, I compulsively give away stuff. I just give away cranes like crazy and all this, you know, so it makes it easier to not give away my weaving. Hmm. If that makes any sense, yeah. you know, yeah. and, um, and also the other thing that they say is, you know, if you do that in the spirit of giving, then the universe brings to you what you need. Now, I have heard that over and over again. And, um, but it's, I, I kind of went, yeah, sure, you know. <laughs> But for some reason in, in during the pandemic, and it well may be that just people were home and they, they didn't spend their money other places. But I, and I did um, in the two years, I did a dozen thousand cranes and gave them away, but I had more weaving orders than I've ever had. And I did no marketing. So I, you know, so I'm kind of saying, well, Maybe that works that way, you know, and that somehow I'm more in balance with the universe. And, and a couple of the people that who were in their final stages of life and with the wish that they not suffer, mm -hmm. I'm, they got to gaze upon these thousand cranes for the last month or so of their lives. The thing that, that their wives said to me was that the thing that amazed them the most and, and you know that really struck them is that someone spent that much time mm -hmm. making something for them, thinking about them without wanting anything in return. And that, I mean, what... Uh, a, you know, what an opportunity, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> to be able to do that, you know, because it's so hard to not monetize every single thing, you know, and um, so anyway, I, that's that story, you know. Oh. I love that. You need to write a book on the philosophies of weaving. Okay. Fiber. So I used to be in the Northwest designer craftsman. I lived in Seattle for 30 years and um, I was, I really owe a great debt to, um, to the Seattle weavers guild, you know, and I was, I was president of the guild. I was head of their, their, their sale and I held all the different jobs and in that time I learned how much I love to talk to weavers mm -hmm. and it was so it really was a very very healing time and there was some other reason that I brought that up about being in Seattle um, but now I can't remember what that is but I will tell you another story, which I'm I know you wanted, that, that yes. you're going to ask me about is um, about when I shared in, when I was living in the 70s in Montana, I shared a studio with a wood carver. Oh, I love this story. Yes. So I'm weaving along and, you know, and I even have that piece. Um, I still have it. It's it's not handy, but I still have it. And I saw that I made this mistake. 
And I just went, oh, I hate to unweave. And he stops and he puts his, the, his sandpaper down and he looks up and he says, many's the time I wished I could uncarve. I love that. And that was like one of the most profound moments for me and realizing that that is the power of weaving is that there is no mistake you cannot fix if you'll take the time. And, you know, so also I believe it is practically impossible to weave something ugly. I have a questionnaire that I give to most of my students and I bury that, that question is in there. And I am always curious to see how many people agree with that. And so, but then I always say, and here, if you are one of those people who does not believe it is practically impossible to weave something ugly, here is my advice. All right, first of all, the reason you think it's ugly is because you had an idea in your head of what you were trying to make. True, true. And as ugly as it is, it is as far away from that idea. So if you take that weaving and you go to a drawer, you open the drawer, you put the weaving in the drawer and you go away for 10 years. Then when you come back, you will have forgotten what it was you were trying to make. And you'll be able to see that with a fresh eye and you'll kind of go, oh, well, this is pretty interesting. And you'll see something that you didn't know that you had put in there. Anyway. Um, I love that. And well, Bonnie, I know, we're, I know we're gonna start running that, out of time. And I okay. wanna ask you one more question about what's next for you? What are you up to now? What's gonna be the next thing? Besides the book of philosophy of weaving. Yes, well, yes. there's a whole other story in that, but um, <laughs> um, well, um, in three years, I will have been weaving 65 years. Mm -hmm. So um, in that, my weaving is going to retire from me. I am not retiring, you know, so I am going to sell my looms. I will probably buy a wolf pup. So I'll have just a little something there, you know, it's um, and um, and then, you know, in, at Rhode Island School of Design, we had two, there were two things in textile design. One was weaving and one was printing. And um, I didn't like the printing thing at all, um, but we had to learn it. And um, and it, that was before computers. So if you wanted to make a mirror image thing, you had to draw it out, it took a whole day. And uh, someone finally taught me how to do on a computer what I could do in, that would take me days to do. I could do it in five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so most people who, weavers who use a computer use it as a pattern generator. So I've been taking all of my designs and putting them in to the computer and doing some manipulation with Photoshop and printing them out. So doing the, so I suddenly the printing end, you know, so one of those other things, how, how do you make money weaving without actually weaving? So that's kind of really what's happening. Even if I live to 108, I know we're running out of time. Um, I am in the last act of my life. And I really want to be able to write that act rather than have a script handed to me that is that I don't want to read. So, so that's sort of what um, I'm. I probably said. So, I think I said something else about that last act, but you know who knows what. But I've been really, um, and then I'll have time to write a book. Basically, I've been resistant because it's been 30 years people have been saying you should write a book you should write a book so i'm totally resistant 
But now I have shifted. Now I am procrastinating. <laughs> I'm no longer resistant. So, uh, so maybe in my <laughs> in my dotage, I will be able to actually do that. You know, you put the best spins on things, Bonnie. You really do. Well, we got some questions for you. How about that? Oh, okay. There's All two right. or three that want to know about the beautiful textiles behind you. And I know you talked about the one off your left. People want to know about the ones off your right shoulder. That yeah. one. Yeah. My very favorite. So when I, I will take this off, but it behind it, this is covering a thousand cranes that I haven't yet delivered, you know, but, um, Oh, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> you did that on purpose. That's great. Well, I just, I mean, I've been, this is going to my physical therapist, but um, I've been, it's been two months. I've folded two more thousand cranes since this one. But this is, this is oh, look at that. one of my most favorite, favorite pieces. This is my horoscope. I've woven my horoscope maybe a dozen times. Really? So this, this is with um, kind of um, the UKI 20 over two cotton, which they don't make anymore. And then I actually dyed the, mm. um, the ECOT. So this is turned weft ECOT and it's um, 48 ends per inch. Yeah, and, it's beautiful. And I, you know, this is, you know, I think if I, if the house were burning down, this would be the one. So I was wearing this to, at this the event and this woman who was a world traveler come up and said, oh, I love your shawl. And I said, oh, I wove this myself. And she went, oh, you wove it? And I said, I, I had arrived. She probably thought I got it on some street corner in some <laughs> foreign land. Anyway, so, and this is all twisted French, you know, so. But, oh, lovely. Just anyway. lovely. And this other one, remember just our yarn? Yes, I miss yes. them. Yes, I miss them too. But um, one of them took a my horoscope workshop and wove her horoscope. Uh-huh. Oh, she had, no, she hadn't woven it. And then she, I was at um, a MAFA conference and they mm -hmm. had just wrote, they just were introducing this line. And I walked up to her and I said, oh, this would make such gorgeous uh, horoscope. And she said, well, who has time to weave? And I said, well, I do have your horoscope. And she's grabbing that yarn off the, and, and I walked away with that. So I wove her horoscope, but those skeins were so huge. I got to weave, this is my horoscope again in that. And then I just uh, over dyed some of the ECOT and did ECOT in the center. So, but that's that wonderful 10 to 10 cell, you know, oh. it's set at 24 ends per inch, you know. And then, well, you know about this one. This is, um, this is a silk from Trimway. No, um, what's the one in, uh, in, in Canada? Um, it was said, there was another silk company and I can't remember their name, but, but I use Treenway a lot too, uh -huh. but this, but, um, but then um, I tied that and Michelle dyed it. Mm, and okay. So, well, uh, we got, I've got a comment and then a question. Somebody wanted to know if you're teaching anymore. <clears throat> and then I saw out of the corner of my eye, are you teaching out at Outer Banks this fall? I'm, it, I, I'm teamed up with Kathy Roig. Okay. You know, because one day she posted something on Instagram and I said, you know, a lot of advanced weavers who are structure weavers say, do we have to weave this in plain weave? You know, and so I've been thinking about that. And then Kathy did this block double weave on Instagram. And I said, oh my gosh, I could take the draft and convert it into a block double weave draft. So I wrote to her and I said, send me a picture of your draft and I'll convert it to a block double weave. And then, so, so for the past uh, over a year and a half, we've been meeting 
And so we've been having this, um, and then we have, and then there's some other advanced people have taken my horoscope weaving. So without me having ever done a block double weave, and I think I probably and never will actually, um, I am, we're teaching this class. So she's actually being on the ground and then I'm doing, I'll be doing, I've already started some Zoom stuff with that group, you know? So I, have, you know, I've been teaching the horoscope weaving through Zoom and, um, and that works out really good. I don't think I'm ever gonna fly again. So I will teach anywhere if somebody comes and picks me up. We'll put it that way, you know? And, uh, or Zoom, you know? So that's, so that's that answer to that question, you know? Perfect. Well, and now here's Kathy. She's got a, hi, Bonnie, my friend and collaborator. I'm surviving the pandemic and my move was made possible by our nearly weekly Zoom chats. So you got a big hi from Kathy. Oh. Hi, Kathy. We're going to see you in a few yes. weeks at Convergence. Um, let's see. Oh, somebody wanted to know about dyeing. So you dye your own, own yarn, right? Or you don't? Um, once I ran out of dyers, you know, I sort of kind of, you know, well, I, I find I'm really sloppy and messy, you know. So I, if somebody has all the setup, oh, well, actually Mountain Colors, oh, that's so great. You know, if you know Mountain Colors? No, I don't. They're more geared towards knitting, but they did oh. have some weaver's wool. And oh my gosh, the way they space dyed their yarn, it was just fab, it's fabulous. And they're in Corvallis about, a, you know, 45 minutes away. So our guild would go down there once, once a year and you, you know, you, they have the gloves, they have the dye, they have everything. And you just put on your old clothes. You just go in and then um, there's another woman, Melissa Arnold, who's in Montana, who's a dyer. You can, I mean, you, she has it all, her studio all laid out. So if it's like that, I will go in and dye, but you know, but now that there's so much, you know, I haven't done really, I have a skein of Catherine Weber's yarn, but I didn't get a solid. So I, you know, but, um, you know, so I want to use all of them. You know, there's so many people that are doing um, really great dyeing, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of like, but you're going rather than say, um, you know, there are two ways to weave. Let me just tell you two words I hate, stash reduction. It, that's terrible, you know. Next to that is portion control in terms of food. Those are my four least favorite words. But, <laughs> um, but I practice what I call ZYG, zero yarn growth. So first you use something from your stash then you buy something. So you're supporting the yarn people. So you're sort of going for a, a zero kind of thing. Um, so I, I think that's a much better, you know, so you can either go, what can I make from what I have? Or what do I, what do I need to make what I wanna make? So you can go switch back and forth, you know? I've always said that yarn is like a fine wine. You need to age it before you can really use it. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. That well, what I do is I say, I take a yarn and I let it have a conversation and let it decide what it wants to be. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's what I do. Oh, Bonnie, you crack me up. Crack me up. All right, there's so many questions here. Um, Here's another shout out that I'm going to read because it's so sweet. Randy Rewalt said, no question, just a comment. I am so lucky to be on the planet at the same time as you, Bonnie. Your crane stories are beautiful. Thanks for sharing them. And I agree, Randy. I think the planet is a better place because Bonnie's here. That's wonderful. Um, 
Oh, somebody wanted to know if you ever do cranes out of material. Is that possible? Um, yes. Um, but you have to stiffen the fabric, you know. Oh. You know, I mean, I have done cranes out, I've done a thousand cranes out of food can labels. <laughs> I've done a thousand cranes out of maps. Uh, maps are great. Anybody wants to send me Rand McNally roadmap, I, um, they will be, um, they will be rewarded, you know? <laughs> um, and um, let's see, um, toilet paper wrappers are marginal, but you know, <laughs> you can do them at, for fun, you know? Um, in your recycling thing, you know, um, there's there is some there's a whole there's a probably a book on folding um, with fabric, mm -hmm. you know, but you know the cranes are not probably the best thing, you know, but I saw a, I saw something on Facebook. I just have to tell you, somebody folding a crane with their feet. Ooh, and I just wow. said, that's beyond me. You that's know? amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of videos, I do want to give a shout out that you have some wonderful videos. I love the video where you were showing the ECOT, the yes. pseudo ECOT, the warp ECOT, whatever it's called, where you, you take the variated... Um, variegated yarn and you line it up. So I encourage people, if you're interested in trying that lovely YouTube video that Bonnie made, if, if I can sit, read it and figure it out, watch it and figure it out, you can watch it and figure it out. That was a lovely, and you are very generous. You, you have videos and all kinds of things everywhere to help people do weaving. That's very nice of you. Yeah. I mean, the thing, the thing that I like the most about the almost ECOT is that it's so accessible. Mm -hmm. And whereas regular ECOT requires a lot, the reason why I backed off of any of the dyeing is because I used to use um, plastic bags. Oh, okay. And I just can't bring myself to do that. And um, raffia works, string works, and also inner tube. Um, in India, they use uh, the inner tubes cut in strips. And you can reuse those over and yeah. over again. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, huh, that's a good idea. Um, let's do one more. Oh, Harriet Ringgold. Hi, Harriet. Um, she says, hi, Bonnie. I remember our class in Palm Springs. It was so much fun. And she said she's going to be taking a class at Convergence with Kathy Roy. She says it's a yeah. small world. <laughs> yeah. And then were you talking about Sanyo Silk in Vancouver? The no. silk company? Oh, no. No, no. it wasn't okay. that. Um, it Susan Irwin said that's another source. Yeah, they were, they were big around, you know, right at the end of the 20th century. I don't know if they're still, okay. um, you know. All righty. Well, we've got another quote for you. This is from Sarah Burke. And she said, this is one of her favorite quotes. And she says it's from Lori Audio. Oh, okay. It says, try not to think of what you're doing as weaving a thing. Rather, think of every piece you make as part of the process of making a weaver. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Sarah. That was nice. I like that. Another yes. plaque for my wall. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a lot of these are kind of workshoppy questions. Oh, uh, what do you like to use for yarn? I think you've talked some about cotton, silk. Well, what do you like using? That one piece at the beginning, I just have fallen madly in love for Bokin's 8-2 cotton. Oh, it just feels so wonderful. And, um, and then I did this thing that, I, and I loved, you know, finding a new yarn. Mm -hmm. And um, doing, and I said, well, I want to make I, a throw. And I said, what if I double it and set mm -hmm. it at 10 ends per inch? It was just amazing. Huh. 
and it comes out of the dryer. I washed it in the washing machine, dried it in the dryer, out of the dryer, just went. I didn't have to put an, an iron to it at all. Oh, I have it, to keep that in mind. It just and it feels really good. And um, I've been enjoying um, working. If you're if you like to make towels, um, I like Aurora Earth um, that I from Cotton Clouds. Um, that's an eight two cotton, but it it's um it the the spin is 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 a little it's rougher, so it's really nice and absorbent, and so I like that a lot. Um, I, I'm my dream is that somebody brings me hemp yarn about an eight eight two weight in twelve colors, so I can make a horoscope weaving. All and right. She's put it out there to the universe. So yes. we're waiting. Yes. Um, Bonnie, we have to stop. Okay. Isn't that sad? This well, is fun. You know, and look, email me at anybody or okay. text me or write me messages. And, you know, I, you know, I've been having some, um, Zoomy groups, you know, that, um, you know, I have a Zoomy group with the a block double weave um, and I have a Zoomy group I calling the Outlanders. And these are people around Montana um, that don't get to go to meetings very much, you know, and so we can kind of connect. But, um, you know, if enough people write me, maybe we can have a, uh, a, uh, a fallout from uh, from this group, you know, and um, anyway. Um, Thank you so much for being on here today. It was so much fun. I look okay. forward to meeting you somewhere, okay. even if I have to go to Montana. Oh, yes, but you can, you know, Montana is great. Also, um, if you are a writer yourself and you want to uh, be the be my ghost writer, you can always do that. You know? There you go. She's really putting stuff out there. Come on. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Bonnie. And you got an open invitation, everyone, to contact Bonnie if you want to um, talk to her about things. Also, I and I apologize, I have, Bonnie, I meant to do this, is uh, check out her Instagram also. She has lovely images up there. But it's Bonnie Tarsus. Uh, yeah. You can check her out. Uh, see what's on her website, bonnietarsis.com. Like I said, she has videos everywhere. Go to YouTube. Do and you I have a guest. Do the ECOT? And I have a guest room, by the it's way. It's just a guest room. <laughs> just, just, just saying, you know. Bonnie, you're going to regret that. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I want to thank the Montana Association of Weavers and Spinners for being our um, sponsor today. Is from Bonnie's Neck of the Woods. And don't forget, they've got a big conference coming up next spring. Uh, check that it's, out on their website and see who's It's on. not, uh, our, we're on the even, not, we're on the even years. Oh, oh okay. It's, it's um, the Northwest, they do the odd years. Oh, Montana. sorry, I lied. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let me back that up. Montana Association of Weavers and Spinners. Go to their website and you'll get the actual information that I obviously don't have. <laughs> Thanks, Bonnie. Okay. Uh, if you would like to sponsor an episode of Textiles and Tea or your guild or your business or you, um, please go to our website at weavespindie.org and you can learn more about being a sponsor of Textiles and Tea. Uh, we want to thank everyone for joining and donating. All these programs that we produce are, are um, financed from your donations to the Fiber Trust. Um, it, and we're so excited to do more programming like the um, designing programs, uh, the Guild Retreat, um, Spinning and Weaving Week, and pros, programs like Textiles and Tea. So thank you. So if you want to, please go online to join or donate or both at weavespindie.org. We uh, appreciate if you want to watch these again, you want to watch Bonnie again. That was a great hour. How much fun. And you can watch those on uh, Facebook. Uh, you don't have to have an account. You can just go in and watch the Facebook Live, or you can watch it on YouTube, and we're putting those up um, 
as we can. It takes a long time to put those up for us. And if you um, subscribe, you'll get a notice that a new episode's been uh, posted on YouTube. So I encourage you to go on and do that. We've got some things coming up uh, for Convergence. Can you believe it? Four years in the making. We are gonna be, I'm leaving tomorrow, packing up my truck, and I'm heading out with all the things we need for convergence. There are some things that we can still, uh, y'all can still involve in. We've got the skiing competition. We're looking for you spinners, come join us. We have lots of opportunities for volunteers. And it's not like you have to give a day. If you've got a few hours, we need things like people to sit in the booths of the vendors while they go take a break. So if you've got an hour or two, come see us and we'll put you to work. Come sit in the, the exhibits. What a great way to spend an hour. You can just walk around and keep an eye on the door, look at things. We need lots of volunteers. Don't forget our shuttle race. So much fun Saturday night. We also have the, competi the speed competition of the track, but you can also do the decorations. So you still got time to get that shuttle ready. So come join us. Um, next week, we will have Ann Richards from England, and we will be doing textiles and tea at Convergence. We're not sure where yet. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you're out of class and you want to come watch, come join us. Hope you have a great weekend. I look forward to seeing you all in a few days. Happy tea. <coughs> <coughs> <coughs>